Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Or, as I'm more comfortable saying in, uh, here in God's country, in my home state of Texas, howdy. So thank you uh, great for that great introduction, uh, General Miller, and uh, especially to General McNabb. See, ah, there he is, sir. I want to thank you for your continued leadership as chairman of the board for the Airlift Tanker Association, and congratulations on the golden anniversary. You know, for 50 years, this organization has lived up to its motto to support, preserve, and strengthen our airmen and their heritage. And our Air Force and our nation are stronger because of your advocacy and your unwavering devotion to the professional development of our airmen, something you and I have discussed on several occasions. And today, this command is set for takeoff under the steady hand of General Mary Ann Miller. Of all the personnel decisions Secretary Wilson and I have made, this was one of the easiest. General Miller is the commander today for only one reason. She's the best athlete in our Air Force and a leader of impeccable character who inspires me every day, just as she's going to inspire you. And together with General Steve Lyons, Steve, great to see you, U.S. Transcom and our AMC are in great hands. Now, I mentioned to you that I am from the great state of Texas. Is there any other Texans that may be here today? Let me show hands. Ooh, I see one right there. What's to, what city? San Antonio, same. All right, so I'm also second generation Air Force. So my dad was Air Force, flew in Vietnam. Uh, my older brother is Air Force, grad, you know, gr retired as a two-star. My younger brother flew in the Air Force. My daughter's in the Air Force, a nephew in the Air Force. This is family business. So is there any second generation Air Force or military in the crowd? Ooh, right, let's see, up oh, right over here. Second generation, third generation? Second generation, okay. So you know how we get to the end of one of these speeches, right? And then uh, we go to that Q&A piece and it's always, everybody stares their shoes. I've, what I've found is if we can just get two questions going, it just picks up the momentum and we have this great conversation. So what we're gonna do is this. San Antonio, you got question number one. <laughs> and what could possibly go wrong? You're here amongst all your friends, right? And you have until I stop yapping to come up with the, ma the most masterful question on the planet. And uh, second generation, you got question number two. And then we'll roll from there. And there's a coin in it for you, so thanks for playing. <laughs> so you know, when we get, together, when we get the chance to uh, gather like this, it gives us a great opportunity to do three things to re-blue, to reconnect, and to recharge. I think we re-blue by reminding ourselves that servant leadership and duty in the profession of arms is about being some part of something bigger than ourselves. You and I are part of a long blue line of warriors who defended our nation and all we stand for as a beacon of hope for the world. And one of the top blessings of serving as your chief is the opportunity to celebrate our history and our heritage. A couple of months ago, I had the honor of calling Jimmy, Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot on the famous raid into Japan, retired Lieutenant General Dick Cole, the last remaining Doolittle Raider, to wish him a happy 103rd birthday. And then a couple weeks ago, I was here in Dallas to celebrate with the last remaining flying tiger, Crew Chief Frank Lazonski, who was celebrating his 98th birthday. And last night, Dawn and I attended the 45th reunion of our Vietnam POWs, 
and their return with honor. You and I must never forget that we enjoy the trust and confidence of a grateful nation, not just because of what we do today, but because of the hard work of those we're privileged to follow. It's also time to reconnect, not only with our fellow airmen, but also with our joint teammates, our industry partners, our mentors like General McNabb and General Fogelman and so many others, and our international teammates. It's great to see you here. Because we've returned to an era of great power competition where the challenges we face are complex and require creative solutions. And I'd offer that one of our jobs as leaders is to create the environment to unleash the brilliance in this room, to think through these challenges and acknowledge that there are opportunities resident in every one of them. It's this opportunity to reconnect with friends we've not seen in years and to build new connections of trust and confidence so each of us leaves here with a brain trust, a network that we can all call upon to help us perform our sacred duties. Because you see, you and I don't have the luxury of wishing away war we don't want. Our job is to be ready, to arm our Secretary of State and remind our adversaries that they really want to face Secretary Pompeo and they never want to face Secretary Mattis. <laughs> and we have the chance to recharge our batteries here at ATA for the important work ahead. If I was to ask you to close your eyes for a minute and just think of your hometown, you'll hopefully envision your family at home, mom and dad, brothers and sisters, aunts, uncles, cousins. And if I was then to ask you, what are they thinking about right now? I think they're thinking about you, family, job, school, church, community, all the things that make up Americana. But here's something they're probably not thinking about. I don't think your family's thinking about it getting attacked by our enemies in your hometown. America sleeps well at night because you stand the watch. We're our nation's sentinels. And just like the long blue line we follow, we've sworn to defend her against all enemies, foreign and domestic, bearing true faith and allegiance to the same. So let's use this ATA convention to re-blue and reconnect and recharge for the important work ahead. And to put in the importance of our service in perspective, I asked the PA team to put together just a short video highlighting your work just over this past year. Earlier this summer, we recognized the 70th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift, which was led by an innovative maverick, Lieutenant General William Tunner, when our Air Force was just nine months old. And we can't forget that this is the 75th anniversary of our medevac lifesavers, whose roots started at Bowman Field in Louisville, Kentucky. 
our medevac crews turned dire situations where we might have had unintended death into hopeful situations where we create unintended life. And whenever and, where, whenever and wherever I see our medevac crews, I remind them that the last thing I want to see before I go under anesthesia is them. <laughs> and to our airlifters, the best compliment I can give you is to share how my joint teammates described you during my tour as a CFAC in Central Command. Fingers, they said, I've never seen a better can-do organization than your mobility team. They always deliver, quietly, without fanfare or bluster. Every beautiful gray tail that lands on a foreign country represents the greatest force for hope and good the world has ever seen. And in your action, interactions, you're often the frontline ambassadors of the United States as you represent the best and the brightest. Never underestimate the impact you have when you descend those crew stairs wearing the uniform of our nation. You're the face of America. Ninety years ago, when Major Tui Spatz flew the question mark flight that began air refueling as a core mission of our United States Air Force, for me, this became personal because I've been drug out of some really bad places around the world by courageous tanker crews who, without a moment's hesitation, flew inside enemy surface air missile rings to give me and my fellow thirsty fighter pilots a drag home. And I'll always be grateful for that. And as the CFAC supporting surge operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, I witnessed too many times how we honored our fallen through dignified transfers, each executed with the precision and professionalism we would all want and expect for our fellow soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. You underwrite the President's ability to strike anything on the globe at the time and place of his choosing. As we put in the end of that video, we're a global power because of global reach. But fellow airmen, now is not the time to rest on our laurels. Like any great chef, we're only as good as our last meal. And one of the most powerful statements in our national defense strategy is the acknowledgement that America has no preordained right to victory on the battlefield. As our predecessors did before us, victory must be planned for, properly resourced, trained for aggressively, fought for, and eventually won in the unforgiving crucible of combat. You know, there are very few certainties I can offer you as your chief. Most of Secretary Wilson's chief rights in my world is somewhat ambiguous, with often little clarity as we navigate the turbulent waters of national security. But this I can say without hesitation. You and I have from this moment until the next war starts to prepare for ourselves for the fight that's coming. And we should treat every week as the last week of peace and a blessing allowing us the opportunity to get ready. Of all we do as leaders, there's one obligation we have that's nothing short of moral. We have an obligation to ensure that every airman we send into harm's way is properly organized, trained, equipped, and well-led to be able to get the job done and return home to their families, who we have taken care of while they're gone. Everything else we do the best we can. This one, you and I, we got to get right. And it's commander business. So let's shift now and talk a little bit about our future 
and where we're headed together. Two years ago, I laid out three focus areas designed to improve our joint warfighting excellence in this era of great power competition. First was a focus on revitalizing our foundational fighting formation, our squadrons. The level of command in our Air Force where the mission gets accomplished, where airmen and families thrive, where true innovation resides, and where we infuse the culture and the character of what it means to be an airman. So we're continuing to pursue a number of initiatives designed to improve the lethality and the readiness of our squadrons by removing readiness impediments and irritants as we restore decision authority to commanders based on our trust and our confidence in their preparation and your gut instincts to be inspirational leaders of character. You know, I have a daughter that's an airman and she gives me great feedback every day. And I'll never forget when she told me, hey, Dad, I don't know what hell looks like, but I'll know I'm there if I ever have to file a travel voucher on DTS to get out. <laughs> and then take 60 hours of computer-based training laid out in just 100 unreadable Air Force instructions. Not bad feedback to get as the chief. We're also focused on the development of joint leaders who are ready to either join or lead a joint task force to do our nation's business around the world, from opening a new base in Syria or Western Iraq to responding to a hurricane on our southern border. And I would offer that this community understands the business of joint operations as well as any community in our Air Force. And third, we must move forward to solve the hardest challenge in executing multi-domain operations, command and control. Because I believe our asymmetric advantage in the future is our ability to network together joint capabilities from all domains to produce multiple dilemmas for our adversaries at a speed and complexity that will overwhelm them. And perhaps this is what defines deterrence in the 21st century as we transition from wars of attrition to wars of cognition. So it's time for you and I to think beyond traditional platforms and sensors and weapons that operate either autonomously or loosely connected. You know, I had the chance to fly the KC-46 a few weeks ago, and I'm here to report it's going to be a great addition to our inventory. But what I strapped on was not an aircraft. What I flew was a node in our future network, computing capacity that we can connect at the speed of light to other platform sensors and weapons to bring creative solutions to the fight. So allow me to plant a little seed here today. Are you thinking yet about how the KC-46 and the X-37 space plane flying in orbit right now and an Aegis cruiser or a tactical submarine might work together? If not, get started. We've made progress in each of these areas, but there's a lot more work to be done. And I can assure you, we're going to continue to push it up over the next couple of years. So in January this year, Secretary Mattis introduced a national defense strategy. And if you haven't read it, take this as a reading assignment from your chief. It might be one of the most readable documents in the National Security Library. And it lays out the operational challenges and the missions that you and I are responsible for as the military element of the national security team. And it directs us first and foremost to restore the readiness of the force to compete, to deter, and to win in five key mission areas. And yesterday, Secretary Wilson laid out how we intend to do that 
by focusing relentlessly on ensuring our pacing units are ready by no later than 2020, with the rest to follow in short order. Of the five operational challenges, first, we got to defend our homeland, which we talked a little bit about. And second, partnering with our United States Navy, we have to ensure a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent so that on our worst day as a nation, our commander in chief stays connected to his leadership team and forces in the field. Third, you and I have got to remain prepared and ready to defeat a peer threat should one unwisely choose to take us on. And fourth, we have to be ready to deter any rogue nation who wants to try and take advantage of us being anchored or engaged in a peer fight. And finally, we have to maintain campaign momentum and pressure in our fight against violent extremism with our allies and partners. So now's the time for us to build on this foundational work we've accomplished in the three focus areas, which are a subset and in perfect alignment with the priorities Secretary Wilson laid out for us. And to execute these tasks, we're going to return to our expeditionary roots as an Air Force. And while this has always been a part of our air power lineage, going back all the way to World War I and Richthofen's Flying Circus, it was General Ron Fogelman, followed by Mike Ryan and then John Jumper, who built the framework for an expeditionary Air Force. So over this next year, we'll build on the foundational work already in motion and update our operating concepts for expeditionary operations in the 21st century. We'll refine our understanding of the specified and implied tasks associated with every echelon of command engaged in combat, combat support, and combat service support operations. We'll refine how we combine operations forward with reach back in creative ways that accelerate our ability to apply global fires in an age where the new contested and congested domains of space and cyber provide both challenge and opportunity when combined with operations in the more traditional domains of air, land, and sea. And we'll build on the knowledge and experience of this mobility community who represents the joint gold standard for establishing a base, defending a base, receiving follow-on forces, and taking the fight to an enemy in a contested environment where access to exquisite communications might be in question. Now I look forward to getting into more detail into the Q&A, which I promised you because Texas and our Air Force Brad are just dying to get us started. <laughs> this is incredibly important work ahead, and we must all grab an oar and row in the same direction. If you've ever been to a boat race or a regatta, which is an Italian word for mastery, it's something to watch. And every once in a while, a set of rowers get in such perfect unison that the boat actually rises above the water and literally flies across the water. And that was what you and I need to achieve over the next two years. Mastery of multi-domain operations. So let me close for questions by reminding us perhaps why we serve as we re-blue and reconnect and recharge. I was just outside the Pentagon on 9-11 when the aircraft hit. You know, you and I wish that evil didn't exist in the world. But on that day, we saw the wolf. And we know if he could have gotten more of us, he would have. Standing between the wolf and his intended prey is you. 96% of today's airmen in this conference hall joined after 9-11. You have never known a day of peace. 
and you represent the greatest treasure in our nation's arsenal. These are, these are challenging times, but not the most challenging we have faced as a nation or as an Air Force. Spatz, Mitchell, Tunner, Fogelman, McNabb, Miller. We have the right leadership team in place and the creative brilliance and energy of the finest fighting force ever assembled in this room. If only our adversaries could see what I see as I look out from this podium. To them, I have one message. It sucks to be you. <laughs> Fights on. Thank you very much.